Okay, now you see this? Bilateral <laughs> surgery? Yeah, okay. The year of ISBCS. Right, and that's because, uh, because of COVID-19, everyone now is extremely keen to do bilateral cataract surgery. They're forced to spend a lot of time between cases cleaning their operating rooms, and they want to do bilateral surgery so they can do two cases in a time of one, um, which is reasonable as long as you're careful. So I brought some uh, interesting points about uh, cataract surgery. The first thing is that the first cataracts were actually done in India uh, in 600 BCE. This guy, uh, Sushutra, was the first one to start doing cataracts in uh, Hardiwar. And then it took 2,000 years before Daviel improved upon that with extracapsular surgery, 200 more years before the first intraocular lens. And then we had uh, 20 years or so of intracapsular surgery. And then we went back to extra caps, and to, including manual small incision, and then FACO. And the stability of FACO in the small incisions is what really made us able to do bilateral cataract surgery. PEMTO is another step forward, but makes no difference. But that's really what made us able to do uh, stable and reliable bilateral cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. So okay, first thing I should say is I'm uh, totally unaware of any publication that shows bilateral surgery to be have worse results than unilateral surgery. And so the question is, why should you perform immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery? And the answer is, it's better for the patient, which I hope to show you. And it's also better for everybody else concerned. And everybody who starts doing bilateral surgery within a reasonably short time of a couple of years ended up doing most of their cases bilateral surgery. So when do you want to embark upon it? Well, as I've been talking to you for two hours so far, when you get everything right, you're ready to consider bilateral surgery. That means you must be doing intracameral pupil dilation. You must be able to deal well with small pupils. You must know about all OBDs and have more than one in your operating room and how to choose the best OBD for your surgery. You must know well about your FACO machine and how to set it properly and know that you're gonna have minimal complications when using the FACO. You have to be good at IA so that you don't break capsules of the IA. Your biometry has to be very accurate. And you, have to, you don't want to be changing lenses and trying to do bilateral surgery and get bad results. So you must choose them well, implant them well, and not have complications. And you must use intracameral antibiotics for every single case you use. And then you have to know that when you finish the eye, the incision is well sealed. You have a plan for what drops the patients will have, the follow-up. It's all totally organized. So it's like clockwork doing them. And until you get to that stage, you shouldn't do bilateral cataract surgery. But if you're at that stage, which most of you guys probably are, there's no problem. It just means changing a few things in how you do your surgery, and you can do bilateral surgery. So I, I, I was the first one in the world to publish a series of 1,000 patients that underwent simultaneous bilateral cataract surgery on a completely elective basis. I began doing these in 1996, and I published in 2003. Uh, my first 1,020 patients. And what's surprising when I reviewed them with Yining uh, Strubi, who's now a professor in Kingston, and Monique Yagev, who's a professor in Israel, uh, we did a review. We found out that we had really extremely few uh, problems and complications, and the results were better than in the unilateral cases we were seeing. But I wasn't the only one in the world. Across the world, there were different people around the same time looking at it. The Finns were probably the first in the modern world to adopt national elective bilateral cataract surgery in around 2002. Uh, uh, Bjorn Johansson in Sweden was looking at doing bilateral surgery and published a case of a couple of hundred around the same time as my publication. And in Spain, they took a different tact. They were doing bilateral surgery on the Canary Islands, but on the mainland of Spain, they were against it. So the Canary Islander doctors got together and wrote a paper, but didn't publish it in a journal. They sent it to parliament and they asked parliament to strike a committee and investigate whether their surgery was any more or less safe than everybody else's. And in 2006, the government of Spain passed an act declaring bilateral cataracts would be equally safe and effective as unilateral cataract surgery. And that's the only country in the world that has done that. So in Spain, it's legal. Everywhere else, you never know. So for my history is I've been doing them since 1996. I've now done about 12,000 eyes. At least 80% of my cataract surgeries now and since I've been bilateral surgery, I use antibiotics in every single case intracamerally. At first I use vancomycin, and then they genericized vancomycin in Canada, and the generics were very cheap, but they all caused TAS. 
And so none of us wanted to use the vancomycin, so I changed to Vigamox, and I was the first in the world to use Vigamox. And over a couple of years, decided what the dose we should give is and how to administer it. And I've now done just under 10,000 consecutive cases like this. And in those cases, we've had zero side effects and zero infections with that dose of uh, intracamel Vigamox. So uh, because with COVID, bilateral surgery is popular, I've been taking part in uh, online webinars at least four per week for the past two months. And one of the ones I did was in French because uh, I grew up in Quebec and it was from uh, Laval University in Quebec City. And I found out from their, their chairperson, Marie-Ève Le Garay, that they started doing bilateral surgery after I'd spoken to them. Uh, they started, because I spoke there in 2013, and they started doing them in 2016. And they gradually did more and more cases to where now they're doing almost 60% of their cases are bilateral cataract surgery. And like me, they have found infection rates extremely low, one in 14 and a half thousand. And they just have far, far fewer complications doing bilateral surgery than they had before doing unilateral surgery. There are 16 ophthalmologists in Quebec City at Laval, all doing bilateral surgery. And they now have 11,000 eyes in four years. So they're doing uh, a lot of them at a quick rate. So how did I start this? Well, my first bilateral surgery case was in 19, uh, was 1983. I had a lady come from India who had bilateral angle closure, secondary to bilateral intumescent lenses. And she went downtown to a different hospital and they refused to operate on her. They said she needed general anesthesia and they wouldn't do it because they thought she was active for TB because she came from, in, from India and they thought India was high risk. So they refused to do it. So her son brought her to me and I happened to be in a new hospital and we had all disposable things anyway. So whether we wanted general or local didn't matter. So I took her in and I did both of her eyes and I put IOLs in her two eyes and she was actually 2025 20, in both eyes uh, on the second day post-op. Her family was ecstatic, and I think a third of my practice is now made up of Indian patients, and they probably all refer for that one family. Uh, it's about people flying from India. I see all their cousins. It's really incredible how one successful case can help you. But then in 1996, when I wasn't doing routine cases, just the odd one here and there, like everyone else who needed general anesthesia or had some indication, this patient came in who was about 40 years old and it was a young lady, very nicely dressed, pristine lady came in and told me she wanted bilateral cataract surgery. So I looked at her eyes and sure enough, she had bilateral posterior subcapsular cataracts. And I asked her, well, what, what do you do for a living? Is there a history of cataracts in your family? Like what's the story here? She said, well, she has no cataracts in her family, but she races cars for a living. And she often, or sometimes bangs her head against the steering wheel or gets something hits her eye or whatever. And she uh, tests Toyota cars in Northern Ontario in, in the Arctic uh, in winter. And she only had a month to have both of her eyes done and be in good enough shape to get back to working. So she wanted both eyes done so she could see with two eyes to drive the cars at high speeds in the tundra. So I, I warned her about the risk of having bilateral surgery. And she looked at me and she said, you know, the risk of driving the cars in the tundra at 90 miles an hour is a lot higher than the risk of fixing my eyes. So I said, well, you're probably right. So she agreed to have it done. And the next day, she was also like 20, 20, 20, 25 in both eyes. And my other patients all complained. They said, why did you choose to take that young woman and do both of her eyes the same? And now she can go and race cars and drive because she was telling them all how great she was and do whatever she likes. And I have to come back in a month or two for my second eye. How, don't I count? Don't I have a, don't I rate? Shouldn't I be done also the same way? I said, well, I guess you're right, but we weren't doing them before. So within a few months, I was doing all my patients with bilateral surgery. And uh, it just worked extremely well. But we weren't the first, me or the guys in Sweden and Finland, the first to do bilateral cataract surgery was Daviel. And in 1747, when he was really unhappy with the results of the couching surgery he'd been taught and been doing, and had been the same since Susutra, uh, he decided to change into extra capsular surgery. And the first case he did, he did his bilateral cataract surgery and then he did another 434 and he decided after looking at his series that 88.5% came out perfectly well, which is an astonishingly excellent result to be done in 1750. When you imagine the complication rate of cataract surgery being done before him was probably 60, 
and yet he was getting 90% success rate. It is unbelievable what a great step forward that was. But of course, he did bilateral surgery. That's why he was so good and had a few complications. In 2008, we formed a society. There was a small group. There were uh, nine of us, uh, four of the guys from Spain who wanted to uh, go. Hello, hello, Steve. One page suggestion of how we thought should be the general principles of bilateral character. This document has since been accepted all over the world, sorry, as the standard bilateral surgery. I suggest that if you want to do bilateral surgery, you get this, you read it, and you follow what we say because everybody else in the world has found that this works. And if you don't separate everything right and left on, you're not talking to staff, you will have it. So we passed this in 2009. We posted on the website, on two websites, the Society of Bilateral Cataract Surgeons and the Eye Foundation of Canada. I'm Canadian and I'm president of the Eye Foundation too. So either website you can go to and you can get this if you want, or you can email me and I'll send you one if you like. So then, <clears throat> Uh, starting in about 2003, after publishing my paper, uh, I began to get asked to go and give talks in various places uh, about bilateral surgery. And most places were inviting me uh, sort of as a hostile invitation. They wanted someone to criticize at the meeting and say, look what bad work they're doing. So in Brazil, I got put in jail, uh, although I, because I found out that bilateral surgery was illegal in Brazil, to speak about it was illegal. On the way out the room, they told the cop that had come in that I was actually was okay just lecturing from Canada. I didn't get to go to jail, but I almost went to jail. Uh, and then uh, in Boston, I got drawn in, in front of uh, a group of, of six litigation lawyers to get up and discuss the, how terrible my work was. Interestingly enough, they, uh, they conferred after my lecture and got up and, and the lead lawyer said, as far as they con were concerned, Boston was a leader in many aspects of uh, medical and surgical innovation, and they considered anything that was reasonably well worked out was quite fair game, and the patient had no complaint about it. And they said they're perfectly fine with bilateral surgery as long as it's being done as carefully as those of us who were doing it were doing it. So finally, I got invited to speak at both the ASCRS and ESCRS in 2014, and they're both being set up so I would go and give a talk on bilateral surgery, and I would then be criticized for half an hour by an opponent. So when I, I went to speak, the first one was ASCRS in spring, and Kent Cyberson was my opposition, and I had forgotten Kent, but it turns out that he was from a group in Colorado where I had spoken in 2003, and they had slowly, slowly converted to bilateral surgery. And after my talk, Kent said that, well, they started getting significant numbers in 2012, and once the patients were seeing other patients having bilateral surgery, by 2013, Two thirds of the patients had bilateral surgery and when asked what they would do in the future, 80% of patients would want to have bilateral cataract surgery. So that was a rather pleasant surprise for me that I wasn't uh, criticized aggressively by the Americans. I then went to the ESCRS in September and Jose Guell, who I knew had done no uh, bilateral surgery, was actually one of the opponents of the group of the Canary Islands, uh, was my opponent. So he got up and he went through the Canary Isles experience and, and saying he had none of his own and went through all the literature and told me that he couldn't find a single paper that showed worse results from bilateral surgery compared to unilateral surgery. And his conclusion was the only thing wrong with it, he felt that cataract surgery was already becoming too trivialized by patients. And that if we did bilateral surgery, the patient could sit up and see right away, they really would trivialize ophthalmology completely and we would you know, not get reimbursed and have all kinds of problems. But I felt that that's not a very good excuse uh, against what we're doing. It's like saying, well, we're doing it too well. We have to have more problems so people are worried about it. So that wasn't really a very good uh, complaint for me. And then I went to see another group and I came back and I got a phone call from this group called Help Me See in New York, which wanted to do uh, surgery with uh, small incision cataract surgery in sub-Saharan Africa and in parts of India. 
And I went there and they asked me to look at their trays and comment on how they might improve things. And they had it set where they could do the operations in for $50 a piece with small incision cataracts or it would take me five minutes uh, for each one of them. It was a very impressive group. I understand now they are doing some surgeries in sub-Saharan Africa and India and doing quite well as far as they tell me. So then another American group, it turns out it was Sloan Rush who gave a paper on bilateral cataract surgery in West Texas there in El Paso. Peculiar enough, Sloan Rush's father, Avery Rush, was in my class in medical school at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And we were two of the four that went into ophthalmology. So I was rather surprised to see his son was a pioneer for West Texas in doing bilateral cataract surgery. And he had it worked out where as contrary to the American complaint of losing half their income, he got it to where they're losing like 20% and the efficiency made it so they were almost even. So his conclusion was you can really do it in most states in the US where they really weren't losing any money and it was more efficient to do bilateral surgery. And they were the first Americans to do that in this system which is not funded by some external source. So then I have some general pearls of advice of those who want to start bilateral cataract surgery uh, about what happens when patients come and see you. And the first thing is that when a new cataract comes to see us, we tend to think they're complaining about their bad eye. If you talk to them, you'll find out they're complaining about their good eye. Because in places where we only do unilateral surgery, patients tend not to come until they're in their 70s. And most people that are older tend to complain about their vision and not really about one eye. So it's when the good eye starts to get bad that they really complain to their family and come in. And I had a number of patients when I first started to do bilateral cataract surgery whose family wanted to have unilateral surgery, not trusting me. And the patient came back the next day and told me that they were no better than before. And I said, well, please explain. They said, well, they already given up on their left eye and their right eye was really worse than they thought it was the day before surgery because now the right eye was worse than the operated left eye and they felt the eye they were using for the last couple of years was actually worse. And so slowly, slowly I began to realize that patients were complaining about their vision and operating on both eyes really makes them much better because we really are restoring someone's vision and not just restoring the acuity of one eye. So second thing is, once you get good at this and you start having patients come to you, the patients and their families really prefer bilateral surgery. There are far fewer visits. They can do it in like two or three visits instead of coming for like 10 or 12 visits. They don't have the loss of binocularity or stereopsis, so you don't get falls after surgery. In one day, they're often 20, 20, 20, 30, really good vision in both eyes, and they can function perfectly well. So they don't get accidents. They can drive their car in a day. They're back to doing normal things. A lot of them, my patients go and play golf the day after, two days later, and they return to normal life very quickly. And what happens is the first patients who came to me in large numbers were not the ones who were poor. It was the doctors and lawyers and busy people in politics and politicians and people who just did not want to have their life interrupted for three months and having two separate surgeries. And they were all uniformly very happy just the next day being okay and going back to a normal life. So then if you also want to do multifocal lenses or do people that are high myopes or hyperopes, people that have high hematropia uh, accommodate much better than a new vision if both eyes are focused the first day. If one eye is minus 10 and one eye is minus a quarter, they usually aren't very happy because they have a different image size and they're uncomfortable. The same with multifocal lenses. They, they work with summation and they don't have the detriments that you have with unilateral surgery if you do both of their eyes together. And they come in happy because they can read in both eyes, they can see far in both eyes, the halos don't bother them because they couldn't see well before and they're really ecstatic that they're doing so well. The happiest group are the high hyper because if you're plus six in each eye and you're now minus a quarter, life to you is wonderful because they couldn't see anything at all before. And they come in, they can see great in both eyes. Um, my only caution with hyperopes is you have to be careful about non-ophthalmic patients. And the best way to prevent post-op balloon glaucoma in non-ophthalmic patients and eye hyperopes is make sure you keep the pressure in the eye fairly high during surgery so you don't get a cordial effusion. And if you keep the pressure high, so I keep the bottle head very high or raise the pressure on the centurion high to about 60, so the whole time 
the choroid is tamponaded, and I don't ever uh, take everything out of the eye so the pressure falls to zero. And then I lower the pressure after surgery. Like I leave it high, low, but I may go for, say, from 60 to 10, but not to zero. And then post-op, I adjust the pressure to like 15 or 20. I'd rather have it 25 for a day than six. And they're perfectly fine the next day, no problems. And then I have a number of patients who got sent to me because they had a problem with one eye somewhere else. And they came and cried about their one eye that was blind from endophthalmitis or detached retina or whatever. And I have two of them that still, after at least 10 years, refuse to have surgery in their other eye. And they are functionally blind because they're terrified of going through the experience again. If they had both eyes done the same day, as long as the surgeon didn't botch up both eyes, they would be perfectly fine in one eye and have no problems. The chances of having a severe detachment or endophthalmitis in both eyes is extremely low if you follow the uh, protocol of the Bilateral Surgery Society. More things. So when you do the second eye, uh, Javit was the first to show in 995 that the improvement of vision you get is better than the improvement you get with your first eye. People think that the biggest improvement in cataract surgery occurs after the first eye surgery, and the second eye is a bonus. It's the reverse. The biggest improvement is when you restore binocularity after you fix the second eye. The other thing you get is you get great uh, enhancement of care by surgical staff. When you have people coming in out of your operating room every 20 minutes, the staff view them as you know 20 minute come and go. But when they come for 40 minutes and they have both eyes on or half an hour and they're having both eyes, the staff view them as someone they have to worry about and they, they're much more careful with them and they do much better. And, so, and then the, finally the COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating the move to bilateral surgery. We started surgery here about three weeks ago and all my colleagues have had numerous accommodations to surgery. And I have essentially none. I do both eyes. Uh, and then I do one patient uh, that's having femto between each case that's not having femto. So then I can go out and do a femto while they're cleaning the room for the patient who just finished it that I don't notice any difference at all. So they clean the whole room, fumigate the place, and it's fine. Come back inside after the femto, you know, five or six minutes, and it's perfectly fine and everything goes well. So it's just much, much easier. One of the great advantages the patients you can do that you wouldn't do otherwise. These people all consented to have their pictures shown here. So one thing I found that's really great is we tend not to operate for just cataracts on amblyopic eyes. If the patient tells us amblyopic eye, you forget about it. But I started to do them because the patients, some of them were, were hyperopes and they are concerned about getting enclosure glaucoma later or other issues. And so I tell them, well, look, just fix the other eye while you're lying down. Worst comes to worst, you still can't see. And then I found out that after doing about 30 of those, it, they got surprisingly good vision. When you correct their amyotropia, a lot of them would recover to 20, 30, or 20, 40 vision. And the worst are like 20, 80, even with a high myop of minus 20 before. And so they come in and they see well, and, and they often gain some stereopsis, and they can function much better. They get binocularity. So I've been really happy. I've done now maybe 100 people with an amblyopic eye, and they're ecstatic. They're all way better. And then you have uncooperative patients, either psychiatric patients or Down syndrome or people like uh, poor Christopher who has Usain dystrophy. And for better or for worse, he's lived to be almost 30. But one thing that happens to them is they have these extremely fragile bones. And if you move him, he will break like 30 or 40 bones just in moving him. So he has a special lift to move him. It takes a half an hour to move him out of his chair onto a bed. So it so happens we happen to have one of those lifts in the hospital and we put him on the bed, positioned it. I did both of his eyes. He wanted one eye to focus on his TV across from one eye for his iPad because his whole life is his iPad. And he's 20-20 for far in his right eye and 20-20 for close in his left eye. And he reads on his iPad and day one post-op, he was ecstatic and he had no fractures. We took him out of the chair, put him back in. It took like two hours for the whole deal, mostly moving him, but he was much better. And then I do a lot of anesthetic class four patients, patients that aren't expected to live very long. Some of them have been more abundant with cancer, but got cataracts from their chemotherapy. And for the last few months of their life, they couldn't see to read or watch television. And so the first one was the brother of a very, very wealthy guy in Toronto who asked me if I would do him because no one else would do him. I said, sure, I'll do him. I don't, you know, worst comes to worst, he dies, he's gonna die anyway. So we, we bought him on the table, we, we just did him under topical, 
did both of his eyes and he was ecstatic. And I've done a number of them since and they're among your happiest patients uh, because they can see for the remaining part of their lives. Uh, and the same for positioning probably. I have a number of these people booked that you just tilt the table or lift them or some contortion to do them. You do it once, do both their eyes and they're fine. Much easier and better for the patient. One thing I insist upon is you gotta be careful. If you do bilateral surgery, what I do for each patient to avoid having left-right problems. I used to make these cards and have the staff take it typewritten off the computer. Now I handwrite them. And I handwrite a card for each patient and I stick it on the microscope. So I see what lens I plan to put in, if there's a difference with ultrasound or with the IOL match, if I use Hagus or whatever equation I use uh, now, and what the results were in the axis of the cylinder. I'm gonna put a torque in, I know exactly what I did, and it's always in my writing. So I know that this will be put on the microscope for that case, and I'll see what I'm doing exactly. I have not made a single error of IOL in the last 20 years since doing this. Um, and everything has changed from right to left eye, so nothing gets contaminated. And if any complication occurs, the second eye is deferred. But you defer fewer and fewer cases as time goes on, I think I've deferred six cases in my entire career, and none of them were due to any problem that I did in surgery. One patient uh, didn't have a consent because her family who speaks all Punjabi told me she agreed, but they hadn't told her she's having surgery. She was screaming during the first operation, so I didn't do her second operation, and then found out from somebody else who spoke to her from the hospital that she didn't get a consent, which is not really acceptable. So anyway, next thing, be careful. Use intracameral drugs. Even in the wildly expensive United States, it only costs $20 per eye to use intracameral moxifloxacin. In Canada, it costs less than two. Actually, it probably costs me about 80 cents per patient to use intracameral moxifloxacin. And I use 600 micrograms in 0.4 uh, mils to exchange into your chamber, and it's perfectly fine, and I've had no problems in 10,000 eyes. Next, you'll be told various things by people who don't want to do bilateral surgery for whatever reason. They tell you the high risk of bilateral endophthalmitis. It turns out we did a study of 125,000 eyes. Endophthalmitis rate was one in 17,000 in the patients that got intracameral antibiotics. And the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis is about one in 300 million. It is extremely rare. If everyone in the world did every eye as bilateral surgery and they all followed the protocols of our society, there would be one case of bilateral infection every 20 or 30 years. That's not exactly a high risk. Um, so that's not a real issue. And then the improved refractive results by modifying the eye or well choice for the second eye after you see the first eye, that only occurs with ultrasounds. Now that we do biometry with LensStar, IOL masters, new equations, uh, we do topography in all of our cases, we just don't get that. I haven't had a single patient had to have a lens exchange since 1999, before we had an IRL master. And it just, we're never off by more than like a half of a diopter. So it's not a real problem. I think to, it's important to do not just these machines, but do topography. That's what gives you the most problems. The patient comes in, this looks good. Topography shows you a bit of a wonky cornea, and then you find out that you have to look at that again because maybe the calculations have to be changed a bit. So, Pearl 5. If you're gonna talk about it in published articles, use the terminology that our society has started because that's what the world accepts. And if you use your own terminology, no one knows what you're talking about. So I've had articles to review for the Journal of Counterfactive Survey and other journals, and you read the article and you have no idea what the guy is talking about and whether it's really bilateral surgery or one, one Tuesday, one Wednesday, or what they're saying but they have to clarify the terminology. So be sure what you say is clear. I like to quote these two uh, things that occurred or articles and discussions. John Bolger was asked to join us for a course we gave in 2008 in, in uh, Chicago. John Bolger was one of the two UK ophthalmologists who helped us start the society. And he was asked to talk about the risk of bilateral endophthalmitis after surgery. And to quote him more or less, I'll just tell you what this says. He said that he will never say that endophthalmitis is impossible. He'll tell you at the time he said it was less than one in a million. Now we figure it's less than one in 300 million, but it's really low. But he said, if you compare that to the other risks we face in life, for example, 
if a patient has two unilateral surgeries, the extra visits they come to visit him, and he's in London, and because of the traffic in London, there's a certain death rate of driving your car on the street. And so he calculated out that, that, that three people would die driving for the extra visits for every patient who might get endophthalmitis. So it's a ridiculous concern to be afraid that a patient may get bilateral endophthalmitis because they might die three times before that. We have to look at all the risks in life. Nothing has no risk. And we try to do things that have the least risk and to target what we choose on what has a reasonable accepted but not excessive risk. And then Olivia Lee wrote an editorial in the AJO in 2014. And basically her summary was that the risk of simultaneous bilateral post-op endophthalmitis after bilateral surgery is one two thousandths the risk of death from general anesthesia. Well, we all send our kids to have their tonsils or whatever done without worrying about it or blinking an eye. So we'd, we'd have 2,000 kids dying before one person would get bilateral endoph endophthalmitis. So the risk really is negligible, but of course nothing in life has a zero risk. So the rationale behind bilateral surgery is that we're fixing the visual system at one shot. We're not fixing one peripheral receptor. It's better for the patient, it's better for the family, it's better for society, it's better for the insurer, it's better for everybody. And the major reason not to perform bilateral surgery globally has been money. And so let's talk about that. So due to the COVID-19 restrictions, everyone suddenly wants to do bilateral surgery. I published a paper and a few more were published after ours showing that normally you can do 15% more cases per day if you do bilateral surgery because it's just more efficient. With COVID-19, you can probably double the number of cases per day as bilateral surgery because it's the same person, no need to change the room, clean the room, just change the instruments, do the other eye. So money and time have become really big issues. And numerous groups, particularly the US where everything really functions on money, are trying to change funding models to get approval for bilateral surgery. So I wrote the first papers on funding a bilateral surgery because I was being accused of it costing more, not less. We looked at the costs in Canada and the costs in uh, other jurisdictions, and we published a bunch of articles on this over a few years. The brief summary is this. It's a bit cheaper doing bilateral cataract surgery. It's appropriate to study the comparative costing and reimbursement of bilateral versus unilateral surgery in different jurisdictions. Unfortunately, in most jurisdictions, doctors are penalized for doing bilateral cataract surgery Whereas everybody else in the system, the hospital, the insurer, everybody saves money. The patient pays less to come less often, but the doctor loses, which I think is totally unfair. It's inappropriate, and I think unethical, to choose to do either bilateral or two unilateral surgeries because you make more money doing one. And up until now, in, in some countries, I think it's relatively apparent that they've been doing unilateral surgery because they gain financially. Um, but it's appropriate for us to lobby jurisdictions to fund surgery equally and fairly. So whether the patient benefits from bilateral or unilateral surgery, you do what you think is best for the patient and you pay the same either way. That's the only fair way to do things in medicine. And that's my summary about finances and bilateral cataract surgery. I wrote lots of articles, argued at many meetings, and I think that's the bottom line. We should lobby to have everyone treated fairly. So in conclusion, the documents for bilateral surgery are to be found on the Eye Foundation of Canada website, which are over here. Bilateral surgery is rapidly increasing around the world, spurred on by COVID-19. I recommend strongly that you follow the general principles of excellence published by our society, which you can easily get if not all sent to you. And the reasons for opposing bilateral surgery simply have not been verified in a single article anywhere. The risk of bilateral infection doesn't happen if you follow our principles. The need to adjust second IOL power also never happens if you use proper machines and topography. And money is a real issue. And COVID-19 really is a monetary issue and not a sterility issue in terms of people wanting to move to do bilateral surgery, which is fine with me. But I think it's about time that we fund in unilateral and bilateral surgery fairly, irrespective of whatever you think is best to do. And I think you should choose what's best based upon your experience, your confidence, your skill set, 
and what you think is best for each patient. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Right, Steve. Can you share my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here I am in person. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Steve, for this uh, thoughtful sh display of the highly debatable issue about the bilateral, the immediate sequential bilateral cataract surgery. But uh, uh, I, I, I want to ask you a question about the number two of the of the recommendation, which is the general principles, general principles intraoperatively. What, what to do to 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 make it standardized? Bilateral surgery. Yeah, well, that's a whole separate lecture, but that's why I just showed you the paper. Uh, Basically, okay. I, I, I need it in lines. I need it in, in yeah. clear lines, because it, clear lines. Let, let me let me say that it's not uh, legal in Egypt up till now, uh, except uh, under special situations. Uh, all of us may may have uh, difficult situations or or patients with difficult situations like the handicapping, the, the long travels. Yes. Uh, 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 but 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 the the, the commonly um, performed here is the unilateral. Uh, or or, okay. or I may say that it's is the rule that the rule to do it unilaterally, because not the all patients have the same have the same degree of cataract, of density, of the visual defect. Uh, and let me again to say, uh, uh, frankly, that the patients here may, may come to the clinic seeking for the cataract surgery when they are almost losing the vision. Not, not That's the, a good eye. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Second eye. So then both eyes are bad. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, all of us here, but I agree. I said the same thing. They come complain about their when their better eye gets bad. They complain. Yeah. Okay. Everywhere's the same. Not just Egypt. Yeah. 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 Okay. But actually, the patient may ask us when I told when I when I tell my patient that uh, uh, that he has a cataract and the, he is a need for surgery, he may ask me, uh, "It's it's quite dense enough to be removed now?" Yeah. It's it's a common. Answer. Well, it's a common. I answer. tell my patients that, that went out in the twenties. Yeah. because we no longer operate on only mature cataracts. You see, what happens is people have always criticized California and referred to California cataract, right? Yeah. Okay, so I always thought we were right in criticizing them because they're operating too early. But then as Canada got wealthier and we went, in the beginning, there only were like two or three of us in Canada doing FACOs, like Gimbel and I and I think Shelley Herzig. And everyone else thought FACOs were anathema and terrible and they were doing intercaps university and saying we're operating too early and you know the whole the whole deal like everywhere else. Okay, so then around came 1990 and I gave the first course in Ontario in the end of in September 1989 on how to do FACOs because suddenly I thought maybe ophthalmologists here would want to learn to do better surgery. And we had it at a hotel by the water, the Admiral Hotel downtown in Toronto, and we thought no one would come. Every ophthalmologist in Ontario came to this course. We had like the place was packed. You could hardly move. I taught them to do capsorexis. I taught them to do, you know, all the steps of FACO. Uh, and within five or 10 years, everyone converts doing FACOs in, in, in Toronto. And I, start, I stopped seeing the black cataracts because everyone was doing them. It wasn't yeah. just a few doing cataracts. So there were now, instead of two of us doing modern surgery and the rest doing antiquated surgery and waiting for white cataracts, everyone was doing... Uh, you know, medium dense cataracts. And so the black ones were slowly disappearing. Not really. We still get some from India and other countries because a lot of them move here. Uh, Toronto's most cosmopolitan city in the world. There's people from everywhere here. Yeah. But anyway, uh, people began to come to me with 2020 cataracts and wanting surgery. And my response was, why do you want surgery? You see 2020. And yeah. the first guy who convinced me came in and he sat in my chair like this. He's sitting calmly and he said, doc, I want eye surgery. I said, what do you do for a living? He says, doc, I want eye surgery. So I looked at his eyes and he had these small posterior subcapsular cataracts. Mm. So I said to him, I will do your cataract surgery if you give me a good reason why you want your cataracts done. Yeah. So he said, okay, do you ever fly a plane? I thought maybe he, would, maybe he had a plane and flew an amateur plane somewhere, right? <laughs> he said, yeah. Uh, yes, I fly sometimes. He said, are you going to any meetings soon? And the academy that year was going to be in San Francisco. I said, actually, yes, I'm flying to San Francisco soon. 
He said, well, you know, I fly that route for Air Canada. And let me tell you something. As I descend in the plane towards the runway over the water, because we always go there, the planes leave here in the morning, get there like about two in the afternoon. The sun is shining directly into my eyes. And with my posterior subcapsular cataract, which I have, which I know because you're my fourth ophthalmologist, mm -hmm. I can't see the runway. I said, I'm convinced to fix your cataracts because I'm going to be on your plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, okay. yeah. so, and then other people come in and it's incredible how people often that are seeing 25 or 25 or 20, 30 are among your happiest patients because they, they do things that our ancestors didn't do. They use iPhones, they do detailed things. I have an architect, people who have jobs where they really require really good vision. And who are we to say, what good vision, because I know like my vision, I, have, I wear glasses, I have these Top Gun eyes. I have 20-10 vision, actually better, almost 28. So I don't want to do anything to my eye to decrease my acuity. If my vision was 20-20, I would be unhappy. I'd be going around looking for a fix because it's worse. So if someone told me that my 20-20 vision is good enough, but like the pilot, he used to also fly Top Gun and he has 28 vision. And when I fixed him, he was 20-15, no problem, right away. Right. And, and that's what he wanted. So who are we to tell our patients how well they should see? So if they come in with dark cataracts and they want to see 2080, okay, better than 2200. Maybe they don't read much. They just plant things in their garden and they're happy. Fine with me. But who are we to tell people what's good and what's bad? But what is bad is when your two eyes are very different and you can't fuse the vision of your two eyes. Then, then we give them another problem and another disability that they have a hard time getting around. Yeah, okay. Uh, let, uh, let let me back to the the question about the okay. uh, the general principles because uh, frankly speaking it's not legal here in, in my country. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll read them to you. Shall I read yeah. them and go over it for you? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'll I'll read them to you. So the first is the cataract or refractive lens surgery should be indicated, and that's because in the 1990s, I the Americans weren't allowed to do. Uh, refractive cataract surgery. So they all came to Canada. So I had a whole bunch of patients who were generals, politicians, senators coming to me because they had like minus 10 glasses or plus six glasses and they weren't happy because they'd look, stand up and give a talk. And they, they looked like they weren't sort of, you know, macho tough guys. Yeah. So they wanted their cataracts fixed. So I would do them and I didn't care what lens they needed. I would tell them the risks and I'd do bilateral surgery and all was fine. Um, so we wrote it that you have to have either cataract or refractive surgery has to be indicated. So they have to have some reason to have their cataract done. All right. And then any concomitant relative ocular or periocular disease must be controlled. So you can't do someone who's covered in mud and filthy and dirty and, you know, has a, a sty that's dripping pus. That's not a good idea. But after you treat them and clean them up, then you can do them. But you can't do them when they're really a mess because you're taking a really high risk. The same yeah. thing if glaucoma is uncontrolled or the retina is detaching or they have unstable diabetic retinopathy and have serious macular edema. You try to control their other problems before you do their surgery. But once you have them controlled, so if I get a severe diabetic with DME, I'll send them off to the retina surgeon. They'll give them one or two injections and then I'll do their cataracts because they can't see well. Uh, they can't see the retina either. So they want their cataracts done. So they give them an injection or two. They come back, I do their cataracts. It's fine. Um, the complexity of the procedure should be easy within the reach of the surgeon. So, for example, in the beginning, everyone does like grade two, grade three cataracts, but not very dense ones and not very soft ones. The soft ones are often equally as difficult as the hard ones. So if you start doing 12-year-olds that have congenital cataract, they're often as difficult to do and put the lens in because the capsule is very stretchy. You have to use tripan blue and all this. There's more issues in the kids, right? They're, and the kids aren't as careful afterwards. But once you go down, you can do those. But in the beginning, do the easy ones. They're the 65-year-olds with grade two cataract. So, but for when you get good at it, you do everybody. So I, I did a guy about three or four years ago who came in and he has bilateral colobomas and he's only 40 years old, but he's missing about uh, four o'clock hours of zonules, and he wanted to see because he, his, as his lens became square on the bottom, he was losing his acuity, and his pupils weren't centered, so he was he had a lot of things wrong with him. But he was from out of town and lived far away, so I said, "Look, we'll just do both of your eyes." 
If I said I won't do the second dive, I'm probably with the first dive. But if the first one goes fine, we'll do the second one. So we brought him in, opened him up, did a capsulexis where the center of the lens would be, uh, took out the lens very carefully, put in a capsule tension ring, put in the lens, put a suture across the inferior iris, made the top of the pupil bigger so it would center his pupil. He looked great to me, did another eye. Next day, he's 20, 25 in both eyes. Perfectly happy. So as long as you've done enough bilateral surgery that you're confident after your first eye that you're okay, you can do all kinds of people. But in the beginning, you don't do them as your first cases. Okay, next. Yeah. Uh, the patient has to give you an informed consent. And one of the things we say in our rule is, you can't tell the patient that you want them to have bilateral surgery. The patient has to freely choose between bilateral or unilateral surgery. Because I don't think you should coerce patients into having unilateral surgery or bilateral surgery. The patient should be free to choose. Okay, unless there's a medical reason but not to have bilateral surgery. But is it a law in, 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 in your country, in the Canada or America? By, no. by, by, by the law. Okay, but actually it, it is, it's not uh, put as a law here. Even consented, even consented, if the patient uh, had a complication, a vision threatening complication after surgery, the ethical and the scientific committee of the ophthalmology here in Egypt uh, will accuse you and you will, you will be put in jail. Because of that. But does that mean it's does that Maybe. mean it's a law or it's customary and your colleagues would go against you? It's yeah. not the same thing. A law means the government has passed a law. No. In most countries, especially I, I think Egyptian law, is it based on French law still or was it based on now? Yeah. Is still, it based on French law. Still based on French, they French yeah. which you can or can't do. Yeah. You can do it if you want to, but your colleagues are the ones who will decide if it's okay or not. Okay, but the, the committee here is not uh, with, it's not with, you will, you will pee. You, well, will you have to convince them, but okay. they may change their minds because of COVID-19 if no one can do much surgery. Uh, okay, but, 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 uh, but let, let me uh, tell you about the problem here after completion of the principles, because I'm waiting for the principles, okay. which, which should be uh, provided inside the war. Okay, so I'm going on. Okay, next. Uh, the risk of right to left error should be minimized by listing all the surgical parameters like I showed you, the lens, the power, yes. the area, yeah. on, on a board in the room where everybody can see it and on your microscopes so you can see it. Okay. So that the, the circulating nurse passes the lens to the scrub nurse and calls out, this is a plus 20 so-and-so technus lens for this patient's left eye we're doing now, blah, blah. And the scrub nurse checks it and then reads it and calls it out to you again before handing it to you, like in the military. Yes. Because the last thing you want is to get the wrong lens, all right? Yes. Um, we have to also make sure we have the WHO checklist before everyone's surgery. The patient agrees to having both eyes on. All right. Yes. Um, and then intraocular lens powers are minimized if the staff in your operating room are educated about how we do biometry. So I make every nurse who works in the eye room learn how we do biometry, what, what the equations mean, which, which, which is a Barrett, which is a Hagus, which is what, what the axis means, what we care about. Because when they know that, they don't make dumb mistakes. If they don't know, they just pass the box. So I make them all learn about what we're doing, and then it's much better. And then you have to have complete aseptic separation of the first and second eye third is mandatory. Yeah. So nothing physically in contact with the first eye goes to the second eye. We change the drape, the instruments, we all change our gowns, we change everything yes. uh, before we go to the second eye. What, what about the cassette? What about the, the cassette? We change the cassette, we change everything. Yeah, right? this, is, this is a point. This is the point. Uh, the, right. the, the, the problems which happened uh, after bilateral surgery with some surgeons that they didn't they didn't right. change. They didn't change the cassette because it's somewhat custom. So they they have done both eyes. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, I'm talking about the the, uh, the the surgeons who are doing the bilateral surgery as as a rule, the normal of them. But uh, I, I I didn't um, I didn't mean the um, occasional doing of the bilateral surgery in special situations like what I uh, what I had. I, I had done just two cases, one handcapped and the other one was long traveled with a very tight time. 
with these yeah. principles. So it passed well, but I'm talking about the problem bilateral endothelmites in a, in a case. <clears throat> the surgeon didn't change. There have been nine cases now yeah. around the world. Nine bilateral cases of bilateral? Every single case, there was, a, you could, if you were generous, you'd say it was a severe breach of sterility. Yeah. They were unbelievably sloppy. One person was operated on when the patient was septic. Yes. With pseudomonas sepsis. I mean, you know, yeah. okay. you're kind of inviting a problem. Another guy didn't turn on the autoclave for the instruments. Well, yeah. they're not very clean. If you don't okay. autoclave. But, but to do it properly and to do it um, safely, we have to put a cassette, separate cassette in the machine for it's each arm. For each right. other, the the the, uh, the instruments, the instruments trail should be changed completely, with a completely. new set for each eye, the the gown, and the the, uh, the scrubbing uh, items of the surgeon and the the, uh, the the assistant should be changed, to deal with it completely as a separate eye. Right. Okay. It's like you're doing another patient. But actually, it's not done. Well, but it should be. If you don't want to do that, then it, it, we just tell you that if you don't follow the rules, yeah. you're going to have problems. Yeah, okay. Nine case, there hasn't been a single case yeah. in any of the people who follow the rules. Yeah, yeah, there have been I'm, nine cases and those didn't follow the rules. Yeah, I am, I'm reviewing all of that with you because somebody here told me that the bilateral cardiac surgery is uh, allowed and is supported by Dr. Steve Arshinov, the president of the society. Uh, but, but I I I, uh, I said to him that you are not following the standards of uh, the uh, the society right. itself. So, so I I I, um, uh, I prefer to 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 make it with a discussion with you to show it for the old now that if you right. want to do bilateral cardiac surgery and to be safe and to be with it legally accepted, you have to to follow the principles. Uh, right. Okay, complete. Yes. Sir. And then you have to use different lot numbers if you can or different companies obds bss everything and the reason that came about was for ovds uh, i sat on the iso committee for ovds for 20 years as we went through one iteration other for, for approval yeah. uh, because ovds tend to be filtered hyaluronic acid many companies and many countries uh, because it's the countries who get to vote in iso not the companies but the countries often will vote in a way that will benefit their own companies, right? So not to be picking any, but, but one uh, country in the east on an island in the north will only uh, approve of anything for ISO if it benefits their companies. Otherwise, they don't allow it, all right? So yeah, yeah. when they wanted to approve OVDs, they approved OVDs to a bio burden of one in a thousand. You may not know what bioburden means, but bioburden means the expected contamination. So everything in medicine that you open, if you open a needle or anything you get, the global accepted bioburden is one in a million, not one in a thousand, it's one in a million. Yeah. If you want to sell baked beans in sub-Saharan Africa to, to refugee camps, the bioburden has to be one in a billion. And the reason is the world recognizes that if one of those kids gets diarrhea, you're going to kill half the camp. So the baked beans have the highest sterility requirement in the world, much more than surgery. Surgical instruments, it's one in a million. But for OVDs, because they were claiming they have to filter the hyaluronic acid and it costs more money and blah, 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 they won in a thousand. So we tell everybody, don't use an OVD from the same lot number from the same company. Make sure that you use them from different lot numbers at least. And what I use is I use from two different companies because every, every company makes copies of each other and you can find for any class two OVDs that are very, very similar from different companies. So I, to make sure the nurse doesn't hand me the wrong one, I use one company's for the right eye and one company for the left eye. Yeah, okay. And same with everything else you get. Everything in your OR should be separate lot numbers or separate companies. Now, oftentimes you can't do that. And for some things, it's probably okay to use from the same company or same lot number. For example, Alcon has never had a recall of BSS. Never. Mm. They never had an infection. So you're probably safe if you use Alcon's BSS. But you may not be safe if you buy your BSS from El Salvador, a company that's been in business for two weeks and just started making it. 
So it depends where I'm not, I'm not picking on someone anywhere. You know, it could be Mali, for example, yeah. any country. Yes. But if they haven't been doing it for a long time and they're not sort of certified by the world as being good at it, you're taking a chance. So you minimize your chance by using different lot numbers and different companies. Yeah, um, then, then you will discharge your patient patchless without eye patch. And the way right. you can't patch because you can't see to do both eyes. Okay. So you have to change your operation so you never use a patch. Now, if you use a patch, you should stop anyway because the risk of infection is 14 times higher if you use patches. And the reason is uh, you can't please. use them drops. Yeah, I want, to right? I want to clarify this point. How, how to increase the incidence of infection with patch? It does because you, you uh, put the patch on, you can't see the eye, they can't see out, so they don't see to complain. If it's not good, they won't call you at night if they can't see. Even, they don't do if, anything. even for a few hours. Uh, uh, but it, uh, there's uh, no reason to patch them at all. Sit up and let them, let them because, go read a book. Because the patient will, will, will move in the street from the, the center to the home. So it may, it may be exposed to uh, any, um, any dust, any uh, non trial uh, uh, materials. I give to, them a pair of glasses to wear. To put glasses or to put the plastic shield, which is transparent I shield? Them, uh, no, I give them those sunglasses, big ones. They put on, cost a dollar for the sunglasses. Yeah, okay. But I, but, them them but, 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 but I think you will, you will agree with me if he put the patch for one hour and then we'll remove it. When he went, uh, when he there's probably more arrived. trauma for the patient taking off the patch than they gain from wearing it. Okay, so don't, you don't you, think that patients are are not uh, are not clumsy. They are clumsy. Watch your patients put patches on and off. Sometimes they put the patch in their eye like this, right? And they tape it. It's in their eye, not on the not on the brow, in their eye. How is that going to help them? Okay, um, if they go and they pull it off. I don't. I, I don't. Um... I don't talk about the bilateral surgery. I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, talking about the unilateral surgery. If the patient ha had the unilateral surgery, we, I can, I can patch. Or you, you, you. I would never patch them. You increase your infection rate. Yeah. Okay. There have been uh, some papers showing that the infection rate is much higher when you patch patients. Okay, but uh, this means that you don't inject the air bubble in the anterior chamber at the end of the surgery, right? <laughs> Uh, correct. I inject uh, be, I inject moxifloxacin. Yeah. Okay. But uh, no need for the air bubble at the end of the surgery. Just thermal hydration of the bones. The vision is sealed, but it doesn't help you at all. It just makes okay. your vision blurry. Actually, it will obscure the vision if the vision is spatulous. Okay. Right. Uh, but but the, the last point, you will uh, tell the patient to buy a separate set of eye drops for HI, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, because I don't trust them for doing anything and not contaminating it. Uh, tell me, uh, tell me to say that some patients may, may, may uh, uh, store the remaining parts of the eye drops of the first eye to use it in the second eye. Uh, it's a <laughs> well, they don't when they do both eyes together. They, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Then some of them will try to save money and buy one bottle and do for both eyes, but they run out. I, I have them come back like ten days later. And they tell me their drops ran out. I said, well, you must have only bought one bottle, right? They uh, said, yes, okay, yeah. buy one of the bottle. Uh, 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 what's meant, or, or let me to say that we are, we are uh, dealing with a different cultures, with a different uh, socio-economical state. We're not. It's, I'm yeah. telling you, you think my patients are so reliable. Let me tell you a story. No, I, I don't mean that. Well, uh, me, I, no, I'm I, telling I, you, they're not. <laughs> Toronto has the most immigrants of any country in the world. I yeah. have people from every, any country. You, I can give you 20 of my patients that speak no English, don't listen, many are illiterate. They have all, you name it, they have the same problem because they just yeah. got flown here by some relative. And, and you are uh, keeping the same, and you are keeping the same. Absolutely the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Because they do better. Okay. So I had one guy, to tell you how reliable patients are, I had one guy who came in for bilateral surgery. Okay, I did his bilateral surgery, perfectly fine. He sits up, you can see great, everything's okay. I say, okay, here are your drops, start taking your drops in an hour, come back tomorrow morning. I always check them next morning because you never trust everybody 100%. I say, okay, I see him next morning. I look at his eye and his right eye is perfectly fine. And I look at his left eye and the iris is, is sticking out of the wound. But yeah. it looks like it happened like 30 seconds ago, like my nurse hit him in the eye, right? Mm -hmm. But my nurse has been told never to touch the patient's eye. So she didn't hit him in the eye. 
So I, um, I said, did anything happen to you? He says, oh, no, no, I took my drops. Everything was perfectly fine. I was great. But you know, it's getting a little blurry now. I said, it's getting a little blurry since when? Said, since I came into your building. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so I gave him pylocarpine drops uh, because I wanted to see if the iris just came out, it would go back in with pylocarpine drops. Yeah. And I gave him some Vigamox, like five drops, and I got a little nervous. And I said, okay, sit outside for five minutes, and I'll call you back in five minutes, and we'll go and so suture your incision the today. Yeah. So he goes outside, he comes back in five minutes. He has no cells in his anterior chamber. The iris is back in the eye. The pressure is 16. The eye yeah. is perfectly fine. Yeah. So I said, look, I don't nice. know what happened to your eye, but you know, whatever it is, it's better. <laughs> I said, why don't you come back tomorrow morning, because I want to check it again, and I'll see how it looks tomorrow morning, because I'm not really confident with the left eye. Yeah, to, to, to pick up this information, if, if we got a patient with a sticky iris to the wound, we have to try first bilocarpine, putting the patient uh, on his back for a time, doesn't matter if I was back or not, just give him the pilocarpine. Okay, before, how he says before going for stitching or reformation of the anterior uh, chamber, yeah. Okay. So I know I learned the same thing. So anyway, he comes back the next day. Yeah. I look at him, right eye is 20-20, perfectly fine. Left eye, the iris is sticking out exactly the same as the day before. Yeah. So I think, what the hell's going on? Am I, am I, no, I fixed the answer. So I, I go put pilocarpine in his eye, tell him to sit outside. I tell him, today, today, no matter what, I'm going to suture it. He comes back in after uh, five, 10 minutes, pupils in his eyes round, pressure 16, no cells in the anterior chamber. I think something, either he's crazy or I'm crazy, something is not working right here. I'm the suture in for I said, look, two days is enough. I'm suturing this guy's left eye because I don't know what's going on here, but I don't, don't want to come back Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you know, forever to fix this guy's eye. Okay. I put a suture in his eye. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. I put a suture in his eye and I yeah. bury the suture, right? The whole thing nice and neat, perfectly fine. So then he, as he goes to get changed to go home, I'm finished also. So I go get changed in the opera. I get it, go out. And between the operating room, hospital room, and my office is a, a, a road about maybe 20 yards. As I'm walking across the road, I see my patient. What's he doing? Unlocking his bicycle. <laughs> so I go over to the guy and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm unlocking my bicycle. I said, why? He says, well, I never, I, when I was a little kid, I was hit by a car. And I've always been terrified of cars. I only ride bicycles. Now I can tell you riding bicycles in Toronto in winter is not pleasant. It's like minus 10 sometimes, you know, mm. it's freezing and snowing, not much fun. But he only rides bicycles. So I said, how far do you ride to come here? He said, oh, not far, four or five miles. I said, but you, you were told to only go in a car and have someone take you after surgery. He says, well, I just told him I did, but I didn't really, I went and I don't want to go in a car, I went in a bicycle. Yeah. So I said, so what happens when you get to the office? He said, when I get to the office, I'm, I have it all planned out because I don't want the doctor to see me all sweaty because I bicycle pretty hard. Yeah. Says, I come to the office and I, and I have in my jacket, I have in this jacket, I have a little rag and I take, and I take off my glasses from the bike and I wipe my head like this, so my eye, everything is nice yeah. and clean. Uh, he wipes his hand right across the left eye and ruptures the incision every time he comes in. Unbelievable, yeah. Riding, you can't trust riding bicycle after, yeah, riding bicycle after the surgery. Uh, <laughs> uh, fortunately, it just uh, iris sticking to the wound, not, not more than this. Right, yeah, <laughs> but you can't trust anybody. Yeah, really. Thank you very much. Dr. Hedr, I think you have any comment, uh, some comments about that. Yeah, okay, Dr. Hedr, after Dr. Hedr, please. Uh, so the only thing I had more was, that was about the things, use IC antibiotics. Um, don't do the second eye with a problem with the first eye. Just a minute. Uh, if you report your data to use the terminology of the society so that everyone can understand it, and that's really all. It's, it's really very simple, these suggestions. Yeah, okay. If you follow those, you'll do well, and don't patch the eyes. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Hedr has some yes. comments, yes? Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I do bilateral uh, surgery only in three cases. Yeah. Uh, two for refractive, refractive lens exchange, and one very old patient, handicapped, rheumatoid arthritis, and she can't climb the stair to, to reach the OR. I do uh, bilateral, just only. Uh, uh, generally, I, 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 
uh, my opinion, I don't prefer to do bilateral surgery in one session. Because there is a great difference between countries here and, and here. Low, uh, okay. special habits of the patient, uh, economic states, uh, in, in environment, uh, many, many factors, uh, uh, obstacles for me to do bilateral surgery in one session. Okay, but in such situations, you, you have I can, to... I can, I can, I, I, I found the great uh, difference in patient uh, single eye patient. Yeah. Uh, I can do as every patient single, single eye patient. Yeah, so no, no, I can. Okay, but in the cases of bilateral surgery, uh, you, you had a consent from the patients? The same consent? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. They have a consent, they leave a right and left eye, that's all. Yeah, yeah, okay. The risk is the same, so it's no different. <clears throat> okay, but... Uh, I, have, I have a comment for what, what you just said, Mohammed. Um, yes. You know, before we had the webinar, we were discussing about which countries control academic interest. And over the last 2,000 years, how it went from uh, Islam being the center of freedom and the center of academia. And well, before that, it was India, and then the Islamic countries and the Christian countries, and how things move in the world. And we agreed that most likely the future, with these computers and knowledge changing so fast, will not be bound by those countries because we see now uh, the Russians fell apart, the Americans aren't doing so good, the Chinese aren't, no one loves them anymore. Yeah. There's a few problems here. So it, it likely will be that there'll be a lot more equality among countries than before. So I agree that the current state that you have in Egypt, because you've had turmoil recently and all kinds of problems, I understand exactly where you're coming from, but I don't think that's going to last. I think that the, the future of Egypt with, with computers and technology and things should be as good as anywhere else. And you yes. should be able to gradually get more affluent and get more things and get the newer machines, the newer devices, and, and the patients will get more educated. And as they get more educated, they will, like the rest of the world, appreciate the knowledge and, and, and not think that you know, it's us versus them, because I think you can't have us versus them when we're both on these computers every 10 minutes. Because yeah, yeah. them that you're talking to all the time, right? Patients now uh, come to the clinic and uh, explain the surgery why I want to implant the trifocal, bifocal IOL. This is very, very, very commonly. Uh, but uh, the, the high percentage of patients are uh, not doing that. Uh, Dr. Hussein, I want yeah. to ask you about uh, uh, about uh, IOL miscalculation. Yes. You're facing ma yeah. many cases, IOL yeah. miscalculation. Yes. And I, 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 I have uh, many cases to ex exchange the IOL due yeah. to IOL miscalculation. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Do you use ultrasounds or IOL master or what do you use? What? Do you use ultrasound or, or yeah. IOL yeah. master? What do you use? For? Well, well, IOL master. The IOL master. The IOL yes. master and uh, and in uh, in some cases the the biometer was the ultrasound, the A scan, the B scan. But mm -hmm. but but th no, nowadays after the IOL master, uh, you said it's it's quite little, it's quite fewer mm -hmm. fewer cases than than before with the ultrasound, especially it's done by a technician which ho uh, who, who may be uh, uh, well trained or not. But right. actually, well actually, what Dr. Muhammad uh, means from this example is the, the, the troubles, the pro, the, it's a problematic patient. So if, if he has any problem with the bilateral surgery, it's, it's so easy to, right. to, to take us to the jail, especially, especially yes. uh, let, me, and let me say that, that the, the, uh, the motherhood of ophthalmology in our country um, do not recommend this bilateral surgery. But, yes. let, but let, let, let me say at the end, if we follow the general principles of the International Society of the Bil Sequential Bilateral Carriage Surgery, if we follow the principles of Dr. Steve Arshinov about the bilateral surgery, uh, actually may be, may be defended by the law. And even we may call Dr. Steve to come to the court to defend it, the surgeon. But it's a defendant in America. Yeah, but provided that the surgeon uh, should follow the principles. But actually, That's it's right. not. If you don't follow the principles, you're in trouble. 
but but Steve, frankly, yeah. frank, frankly speaking, it's not. No, nobody will exchange the cassette for HI. For HI? So, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah. So I think things will gradually change in Egypt too. They will change everywhere. Uh, actually, uh, we have we have we have a surgeons yeah. here who are doing bilateral fecal surgery, and I have uh, admitted uh, with one of them in the OR. Many years ago, around six or seven years ago, he's doing bilateral cardiac surgery with the same uh, cassette, with the same instrument, and with the same scrub, just to change the glove. Between the, well, no, but you know, if, if he has both. a problem, he'll be in big trouble. Yeah, okay, this, the, both eyes, bilateral, bilateral phaco in very soft, insignificant cataract, uh, because of what, I don't know, and discharging the patients with um, with eye beard, without any uh, plastic shield, without any glasses, uh, uh, he's doing that as a new, uh, as, as a new era, as uh, as he is doing some something different, but actually is not following the principles. So I'm talking a, right. a lot about the principles to show it for everybody. But you see the, the the risk, even if you don't follow the principles exactly, the risk is low because I mean I've done I don't know. 40,000 yeah. cases. Yeah, he had, he had many infections. Bilateral in the mites. Next yeah. to none, even before bilateral surgery, you, you go, don't get many infections. So you go along in life and you, you don't get many problems, but um, the chance of getting them is higher if you don't follow these principles. And if you do get a problem, you could be in big trouble in many countries. Yeah, he had actually many, many cases with bilateral endothelomites in cases of well, yeah. cataract surgery. Also after uh, uh, iris claw, the anterior chamber, the fake IL, anterior chamber, fake IL, bilateral. There's, no, I think there's no need for that. No. Uh, yeah. You should put lens in the bag. Yeah. B uh, a bilateral, anterior chamber, fake IL. Why? There's no indication, there's no urgence for that. Right. So if we follow the instructions, if we follow the principles, I think it's well, it, will, it will be much better will be with, 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 with much better outcomes and uh, good behavior. Uh, and, and, and then maybe the ethical committees and scientific committees in our country uh, will um, support this. Yeah. Uh, but there are the, many things we all do in, in surgery that are relatively new. We might use a new kind of a shunt or whatever for glaucoma. Yeah. It's expected that if you're a doctor that you're careful. If you're not careful and you get caught, too bad for you. Yeah. You deserve to get caught. So, but if you're careful and you do it very well, it may be that a patient has an unfortunate complication. That's always a risk in life. Yeah. But I don't think that anyone could take you to court and win if you were careful, yeah. if you can show that you're careful. But if you're not careful, if you don't follow the principles, you don't do this, don't do that, and you yeah. use don't change your gloves, well, tough luck, you're guilty. Actually, if I, if I pushed or forced it or are subjected to a special situation to inject intravitreally in some, in some case, a bilaterally uh, injected eyes in the same situation, I'm, I, I'm using a separate, completely separate tools uh, for, for all, even the scrubbing. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, I don't think the bilateral surgery in the, in the uh, non-exceptional cases which we were talking about, it, it would be a criminal work if not followed, if not based on the principles. Right. As right. long as you're careful, yeah. you're fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dr. Modesser. Dr. Modesser, I'd like to share. Dr. Steve, I have, okay. uh, please, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, you, you have uh, already explained, but uh, not clear for me. Uh, how can eye patching uh, increase the rate of post operative infection? This is number one. Uh, number two, the, the, the technique of uh, immediately sequential bilateral cataract surgery, is it approved by Canadian, uh, Canadian guidelines or uh, filling the requirements of, of uh, some uh, guidelines like, like uh, JCI, Joint Commission International, or covered by uh, Canadian Health Insurance? Okay. Um, Good questions. What was Just the first question? <laughs> What was the first question? The first question, the first question how, how about, about eye, patch, eye patching. How oh, eye patching, patching yes. increases okay, there, yes, the there rate were of post-operative infection. 
in North America around uh, between 2000 2005 that showed that in the same center, if you patch some patients and didn't patch other patients, the patients that were uh, patched had a much higher infection rate. Uh, and it also the mechanism, to, what the mechanism? Uh, pardon uh, me? Yeah, yeah. Doctor, what the mechanism? What's it? Dr. Mudassar uh, uh, wants to know the mechanism how to increase the incidence of infection. Uh, the eye patch will prevent the, um, the, the infection. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't prevent anything. It's by the logic way, it will prevent the infection. It will cover the eye and then... No, it doesn't. Do you yeah. think the, the air how? blowing in your eye when your eye is sealed causes an infection? Yeah, okay. But, Thank but, you. Tears but, are very, when you take, sorry, sorry? say, post-op Vigamox, your tears are sterile anyway. You don't get anything in your eye from the wind. I mean, you might if you're in a hurricane, but not normally. Okay, the, the question, the question, how it, how it does prevent, sorry, sorry, how it does increase. It's because someone's increase, playing with their increase, eye. Because of Every what? Every time you have a relative or someone goes and plays with their eye, yeah. where they put the patch on, take it off or fool around, yeah. they cause a problem. So yeah. I saw one patient where the patient with endophthalmitis, it was caused by the ophthalmologist who took off the patch and pushed on the eye when they measured pressure. Yeah, okay. They left could, them alone, he would have no problem. I will, I will, uh, uh, I will summarize your answer in two words. If the eye patch is put, is put on, on the eye after after um, finishing the surgery, uh, then it will it will be it will be put on a sterile eye. And if when a patient remove it for the eye, the eye is the, not sterile. And to put it again, it will be a source of infection because. Yeah, but the eye is not yeah, sterile. Yeah. The, the eye, eye is the only this, 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 open this in your blinking. It's not. I'm, I, I mean disinfected, yeah. By the by the bovidone iodine and by the eye drops bought at the end. If you, perhaps if you use intracameral Vigamox. You, you mean that perhaps the, if you leave Vigamox intracamerally in the eye, you then mean you'll have less chance of infection with the uh, a patch. But if you don't use intracameral Vigamox, for example, and then you give them just drops. The sooner you start the drops, the less chance of infection. Just giving topical Vigamox drops gives you enough in the anterior chamber where it kills everything except for the three or four most resistant cases that are published of enophthalmitis. So if you don't, if you patch them and don't give them drops, the risk always is the first 12 hours or 24 after surgery. So if you don't patch them and you start them with drops an hour later, you're much better off than if you do patch them. If you patch them and you gave intracameral Vigamox, as long as the wound is sealed and not leaking, you're probably okay. But if the wound leaks, you may get back leakage from the patch, which becomes dirty, by the way, within 10 minutes from the tearing of the patient and stuff. Um, is it the same, Steve, the Steve, Steve is, it, is it the same with the extra capsular su surgery where there's stitches and, um, and uh, gant wound? Is it the same for the extra cap? Yeah, any, anywhere you have a gap where you can get bacteria in, it's, it's not good to patch them. Yeah, okay. You just, uh, you just increase their risk. Honestly, you increase you, their risk. If you leave them alone, yeah. and if you, go, if you look at your patients, what I did to find this out was I would do surgery and I would have patients stay. And I'd check some one hour post-op, some two hours, some three, some four, and look what happens to their wounds. And you see that as they heal, they do better. And so I tell my patients to take their eye drops and I give them drops because it's a little bit safer in case of a wound lick to take post-op or antibiotics. Uh, and I have them start the drops an hour post-op and just to pull the lower lid down, not to touch their eye, and put one drop in six times a day, including six times a day of surgery. Also, when you give the steroids and the NSAIDs six times a day of surgery, you decrease your risk of things like CME uh, to just about zero, because I don't get any. And they do much better taking the drops. I mean, I, I, it may have not been your custom, but if you try, you'll see it works better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm convinced. <laughs> I, I, That's I, fine. I, I agree. <laughs> Dr. Dether, uh, the answer. My, my second question. My second question. The answer of the first oh, question, first question, is, question. Is, okay. is clear now. Yes, that's, that's a very complicated okay. question. And I'll tell you okay. why. In British democracies, the government never makes those rules, all right? So there are no laws which you can or can't do. Oh. British common law is what's common practice. So if I'm the only one doing bilateral cataract surgery, 
my colleagues can crucify me. But if a certain percentage of the population that are regarded as being ethical practitioners do bilateral surgery, what I'm doing is fine. As far as guidelines that come, let's say the preferred practice patterns from the US or the Royal College puts published them in England, guidelines are always historical documents. They tell you what people did two years ago, not what's happening now. So if you look at guidelines for glaucoma, none of them include any stents because they're all published a few years ago. So everything that's new is not in the guidelines. So if we only follow guidelines, you'd never do anything new. So then if you, if you accept that we do new things sometimes, then you have to go upon British common law, which the US, Canada, Britain, many countries use British common law, which goes by what's customary and accepted in the profession. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mudathar means that uh, the bilateral surgery in Canada, it's one of the evidence-based medicine or, or worldwide could be detect, could be considered as a, one of the evidence-based medicine. Yeah, sure. There's a huge group doing it more and more every day. And there's lots and lots of articles showing it's just as safe or safer than bilateral than two separate operations. Okay. Uh, okay, Dr. Mohammed. Okay. Okay, okay, Dr. Sam. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Thank, oh, thank you. you. It's a good question. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Steve. You know, what, you know what a good question means? It means yeah. the person answering the question needs time to think of the answer. <laughs> again, again. You tell them it's a good question. It gives you time to think of the answer. Yeah. Okay, the good question means that uh, giving the, the, the clues for the answer for the, for the speaker. The person answering has, wants to say something to give himself 30 seconds to think of the answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, really, it's, it's highly debatable uh, issues in the, for the correct surgery, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's well, I think it's well clear now uh, after the, the discussion, after the showing of the old parameters, uh, sorry, the old principles and the old guidelines by Dr. Steve. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steve, all the time are giving us the, the, um, the fruitful knowledge and experience. No, thank you very and, much. And, and we are squeezing you all the time. So, well, to, uh, it's to, a pleasure, <laughs> actually. You're, you're one of the uh, more enjoyable groups to talk to. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. We we took we took you from your uh, your family and the cottage and the barbecue today for our barbecue, which is more delicious than uh, <laughs> uh, th th than That's the right. other. I think. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve Arshinov. Okay. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, okay, and and we will uh, we will meet again uh, soon for the OVD and the other parts of the cataract surgery. Uh, okay. Thank thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Muhammad you. Uh, for a pleasure, a great panel thank you, discussion. Thank and, and thank you for the all audience who are still with us up till uh, this this uh, very late time. Thank you, and see you again in another uh, scientific event. Good night. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Steve. Bye bye. Bye bye.